Life's Essential Ingredients with Jeff and a mic, where we hope to inform, inspire, and transform lives one essential ingredient at a time. Welcome to the show. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients. Uh, I am flying solo today without my Pasho, uh, so feel a little bit funny, uh, but we're going to have a great episode and really have an interesting guest who has done some amazing work within her career as a chemist to bring that subject matter to life uh, and simplify it. And that's how I think you really are good at what you do when you can take a subject matter and teach it at the most simplest form to preschool kids uh, and you know be a, a PhD and teach it to other uh, doctors and, and college students and so yeah she's has some tremendous insight for us uh, this episode but again thanks for tuning in to say good morning and and our guest is in Carmel Indiana so three hour time difference for us it's nine o'clock right now in the morning for me and noon for her so Stephanie uh, good afternoon and thanks for uh, tuning in and being our guest uh, on life's essential ingredients Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, we're excited. So a little bit about our guest. Um, first of all, where you can find her, and again, it's Dr. Stephanie Ryan, uh, and she started her own education consulting firm. And so I think that's where I'll direct most people because hopefully you're going to take all the tremendous insight you're going to gain from her and reach out to her uh, and say, hey, I want to bring what she's doing to my institution, to my home, to my kids, to my brothers and sisters. And she has some tremendous insight information so you can find her at www.ryan r-y-a-n education consulting.com so again uh, ryan education consulting.com and then she has a tremendous uh instagram with quite a few uh followers and just some cool stuff i was uh on checking out what you're doing and just have i just tell you have so much fun uh doing that and her instagram is let's learn about science uh, again instagram let's learn about science and that's Dr. Stephanie Ryan. So a little bit more about her. Uh, she's a PhD chemist, a boy mom, a social media influencer who enjoys using her background to create superior educational products and content. And I love that word superior. Uh, and it's definitely reflected in what I was seeing uh, about you. Uh, you could have just said create educational products and content. Uh-uh superior uh, and, and so tremendous uh, work that you do although an academic at heart dr stephanie is passionate about learning through play love that again uh, the older i get the more i kind of evaluate each and every last word that people use uh, and, and say and uh, learning through play when you look at education that's where the money is, you know, and that's where I think we've had a, a deficit uh, so far is because so many times, and I don't know, you, you probably don't know, but my last job was as a nursing professor at a community college. And uh, when I did well with my students, we were learning through playing and just bringing the, the content to life. So she can be found helping young kids explore the fascinating world around them. Her recent book for small children, Let's Learn About Chemistry. Again, an incredible book. If you have young kids that you want to bring education to life, you got to get that. You can find it at Amazon and everywhere else, I'm sure. But Let's Learn About Chemistry. That book was a finalist for the 2021 Next Generation Indie Book Award for Children's Slash Juvenile Nonfiction Category. So congratulations on that. I'm still going, though. Uh, over the years, Dr. Stephanie has taught science to all age groups, both in and out of the classroom, helping talk toddlers learn about their world and college students define theirs that's deep right there and i'm still going so you can just sit back and listen but i love i just love the words you use helping toddlers learn about their world and college students define theirs if you just look at education and you fast forward the influence that you're having on these toddlers and then now you see them as college students and how you, by the work that you're doing at such a young age to help people, 
helping them define theirs and at such an early age. And I think that's just where there's a huge gap right now and why I'm so excited that there are people like you sharing their expertise with young people to bring education to life. We're almost done. She's an active member of the chemistry education community and is currently a committee member of the International Activities Committee for Division of Chemical Education. Dr. Stephanie earned her PhD in learning sciences and her master's in analytical chemistry from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She earned her BS in chemistry from St. Mary's College. Dr. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, excited. And uh, I just want to go back because I really didn't give you time to talk, uh, but helping toddlers learn about their world and college students define theirs. Let's just start with that kind of statement. Uh, that's powerful in itself and bring that to life for the listeners. Yeah, so kids are learning literally everything. They're blank slates. And so anything we teach them that you are filling cups with water, that one cup holds more water than the other, like they are learning about the world around them. And then you can take that curiosity and the learning that you do there, and that develops a passion or curiosity that kids have of where they'll feel more comfortable asking questions and exploring and figuring out the world around them. Then they get to college and that helps them putting things in a context that shows real world applicability instead of just facts in a book. Um, That helps them see how they would use this science in their life and maybe even open their eyes to some of the things that they didn't know about, like some things with like climate chemistry or uh, pollution water studies and things like that. So like you mentioned with nursing, um, that's actually how I got into all of this was I was a TA for a nursing level chemistry course. And the professor I was working with, she let me design it all. And she said, you know what, if you've got cool activities, let's do it. And I had so much fun creating these contexts for the nurses to make it just more interesting because it's very important for them to know concentration. And but there are better ways to teach it than just this math problem, you know, Um, and so really getting at that and I, I thought that was a really cool connection. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you said so much right there. And I wish I would have uh, taken my chemistry course from you. Uh, I, I snuck by that one with, I think, a C or maybe a C minus. That was not a uh, easy subject matter for me. And it, I didn't have someone like you that that brought it to life and then made it something that I could relate to. You know, And obviously, everybody has a potential to learn. And that's just where I'm excited again to learn from you today and for our listeners, um, because it's about just putting it in the context of which you can apply it to your life. And that's your expertise or some subject matter that you are using every day and then have somebody like you that really understands the subject matter and can say, hey, well, here's it's the same thing. And here's the concept behind this and then once you get that concept and you have the applicability like you were saying then you're off and running but that's the challenge i don't think uh we've done a good job of helping people break it down in simple terms to apply it to something that they can understand and then okay now let's look at the the real concept that we're talking about uh and then i love two of uh, uh, one thing that uh, I hope we can get back to as far as asking for help, you know, and that's why I'm just so excited that you're doing your thing at a young age uh, of making education about asking questions, not being afraid to ask questions, making mistakes, learning through the mistakes, and then taking that all the way through their whole, you know, elementary, uh, middle school, high school, and then for sure getting to college where you create this culture that it's just about, Hey, the more questions, the better, because that's how we're going to learn. Um, but I think that's where there's a, again, the, the big, the big gap. Um, and, and even I think for, for, uh, parents, you know, I'll say, I'll use myself as an example, terrible in math. 
not not good. I was another uh, space where I could work hard and figure out the calculations and things that I needed to do. And I worked as a nurse for 29 years uh, and half of those at the bedside. Um, before you had all the pumps do all the work for you, you know, and calculate your drip rates and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, I imagine this is where you help parents who, who don't maybe aren't so good in chemistry and, and there is a gap. And so they're hesitant to introduce something to their children. Um, and I haven't had the good fortune of reading your book. Um, but what tips would you give for somebody that's just like, nah, I'm just, I'm not good. I'm good at, you know, constructing things or other things, but this chemistry stuff, uh, now I'm not going to really bring that up with my kids. What insight would you have for that? Yeah. What I like to tell parents is to remind them that kids don't know anything. Like they're starting out again, like a blank slate and you lived life so far and you have had these experiences. You know that when you drop something from the kitchen table, it will fall. You know that ice cubes melt when they get warm. You know these things and your kids don't, especially the young ones. And so you have this life experience and you should feel a little more confident in yourself. You don't need to be a, an astronaut to be able to do these. It's just you need to be able to get over your own fear of it and not project it onto your kid um, because that's what happens happens with math a lot is that, oh, my mom doesn't like math. I, I might not like it, you know, and they get that feeling. But this science, I'm not talking about science that you have to go buy a kit or do something. It's stuff in your kitchen. It's things you could just do at home. And it's not really adding anything. It's just reframing some time you have um, with materials you already have. So I think that making sure the parents have that extra boost of confidence because at first I was focusing on the kids and I realized it's the parents who need some help. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where things shifted during the pandemic was that instead of designing an activity for kids, I used the activities I already know for kids and I taught them to parents. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of questions you can ask. This is a great spot for you to say, cool, how would you do it? How could you capture that gas from that reaction? Balloons are great for that, you know, put it, make a closed system. Um, and so of coaching parents through those things and then highlighting any mistakes that are, are made along the way. Like I made a baking soda and vinegar rocket a few weeks ago, I was filming it for my content. And very, very cool. <laughs> I did not tape the pencils on as well as I should have. And they got a little wet and it tipped over before it launched and it spilled vinegar all over my yard. And I have a dead patch of grass there. And so what I do is I say like pro tip, <laughs> like try this, I did this. Or like we made a baking soda and vinegar fire extinguisher once and it, I put way too much vinegar in and it sprayed up all over me and my son's laughing in the background. It's just like, I do this for a living. And if you're just doing kitchen chemistry, you're not doing, ac oh, you can, you can do accurate measurements using teaspoons and things if you really got into it but i was just dumping here and there you know and it's like that stuff happens and it's okay <laughs> oh man I, lo I love hearing that too because i didn't get to go through all your instagram but i did i think that was a, a recent uh post uh, the one with the rocket yeah it was on some wood table and uh yeah i couldn't tell if it was straws and now hearing from you is pencils but i could see that you tipped it over to be on the on the pencils and then kind of got out of dodge and then now hearing that it kind of exploded all over you uh and the grass just it, it is awesome you know because that's where so many times and, and everybody always says it but uh you learn more through mistakes you know but and i agree with that but i think you have to be in that space and you have to kind of get out of your own way and I think life has to allow you to not have so much stress to where when you're trying to do something with your kids or at work or whatever it is, and then things don't go well, then I think uh, if we don't catch ourselves right there at that moment and just take a deep breath and say, hey, what, what am I really doing you know, right now? Is it about getting through this task or is it about having fun with my kid? learning about something that I'm terrible at, but role modeling that so 
they can see that it's okay to make mistakes and to figure stuff out even if the if the rocket doesn't ever launch you know and i just think if if we could you know get into that space we'll be so much better off and then our kids know i don't have to be perfect you know and one one little short story it's taken me back uh my first not my first day, but one of my first lectures, you know, I've been a, a speaker in a high school and college basketball coach, and I have two daughters, and um, my oldest daughter happened to be home uh, when the semester was starting, and she's seen me do a lot of things well, you know, and she's seen me make mistakes, but I, I intentionally wanted, because I knew my lecture was going to be a mess, you know, and, uh, and I'll jump back to that comment in a little bit but i said i I want you to come watch me lecture today and nursing you it's like six hour lectures i mean this is yeah you're not going and talking for 50 minutes i mean you have some content and i wasn't even familiar i kind of got thrown into the thing by my choice didn't have all the time to prepare as much as i should and uh, i just knew it was gonna be a rough go and i say i want you to come watch dad and i wanted to role model to her that you know you just can do the best that you can do and and i got up there and i was awful uh, it was a, the worst lecture i've i've ever given i'm surprised the students didn't throw stuff at me um but i even started out as like hey just like i'm telling you now uh, my daughter seen me do a lot of great things but she hasn't quite seen me struggle like i'm getting ready to struggle and i wanted her to come watch this and to see that it's okay you know as long as you're giving it your best and you know i prepared as much as i could within the time that i had but uh yeah i just think if we can if we can role model some of our struggles a little bit you know uh to our children and we'll keep this show you know about families and young kids and even teachers just say you know i don't have all the answers that's a really good question you know let's either try and figure it out or let me research it and get back to you Uh, i think we'll just all be better off uh, for it and again make learning fun you take out some of the pressure of it yeah and if you talk to scientists um they look things up all the time we reach out to each other like hey i'm not an expert in this can you talk me through this i would say we get conversations like that once a week from people who aren't even at our own places of work you know like you'll get that of like hey can you step me through this content one more time i need another look at it um and it's something that's definitely generationally different because i know that i struggle with perfectionism and because knowing the right answer meant you knew what you're doing where now that's not really it's being able to explain it you know what you're doing not just knowing the fact itself and i think the kids are just so much better equipped to asking these questions and asking for help because like my son he's four and he'll ask a he'll ask question i'll say i'm not sure and he'll go let's ask siri and he's just ready to do it like let's look it up and it's like cool that's so good that that's where we're at but um i also very consciously show mistakes i highlight them all the time because i am a perfectionist um and i struggled with anxiety because of that like through my whole life um i make sure that because my son is a lot like me so i try to model like look mommy made a mistake but look i turned it around and we did this or wow i did not turn this around and now dinner is ruined today and we're getting takeout like (laughs) and it's okay like you guys all still love me that i made this mistake like it's okay but next time i need to pay more attention you know like i we try to talk about the lesson the takeaway and um but that's something that i do have to keep a very close eye on on the Instagram account because I have had I have a friend who I can always trust she has a kid about the same age as my son she'll message me and she'll be like please tell me that sometimes you just put him in front of the tv and have a cup of coffee that this isn't just what you do all the time and I was like oh no I've become a Pinterest mom on Instagram and that is not what I mean to do. So I've, I've really started opening up more of mistakes and how I struggled with things and um, things like that to make sure that, hey, however you're doing, it's great. I'm just trying to add another, like give you another lens to work through and give you some confidence. <laughs> 
Yeah, I love that. And what a great, I'm glad your friend reached out and, you know, the good and bad news uh, uh, about social media is the comparisons that, that come up, you know, unfortunately. And again, it's, that just kind of gets back into the space, you know, not to, to bring up a, a conversation that wasn't even part of it, but, you know, that, that person of comparing herself to you and saying, oh, I got to do all this and that, that's a whole, and I already get, that's not the intent of what you're doing. You know, your intent is, Hey, if you have a second and you're looking for some cool science thing to do, uh, with your child, uh, here's some fun stuff that we're doing. Uh, and I think if we just keep it in the right context, then we all get to, to share our best self, you know, uh, and I'll lead that into the thought of the day because I've been so far off just getting excited uh, about what you do. So normally we would have brought this up five, 10 minutes ago and it's a short one for you. So I'm, uh, uh, yeah, this is what I see in you. So here it is. Um, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And that's from Pablo Picasso. Why would I pick that for you? Because uh, that is definitely my philosophy. <laughs> um, I used to say uh, I wanted to be a doctor when I was growing up, and I ended up not going that route because I liked teaching. And I now say often, like, I'm not a doctor, but I'm helping train, like, thousands of doctors. So if somebody uses any of the materials I've developed, that I'm having an impact on someone else and they're not afraid of science, they're not afraid of math, and they're they're having a better experience than I did going through it. So definitely that quote it hits home. <laughs> Love that. I'm, I'm not to be uh, arrogant, but I'm 100% on these babies. Uh, and that's what's so fun for me and in, in research. And I said, Oh, man, this lady, she's, she's just got a gift. And then she's giving that gift uh, away uh, with everything that she's doing. And then yeah, and I'm sure you're aware, you know, of the impact that you have back to what you were just saying about your helping young people get into the medical profession because you're teaching them the chemistry and teaching them to not be afraid of, of math and science and how that totally transforms their whole life and, and gives them confidence in, in so many other parts that you're not even aware of, I guarantee. Uh, and so, so cool for you to have that influence um, and to use your gift uh, to help people. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for, for the work that you do and, and, and for sharing your gift. Um, I think part of your gift in researching you uh, started, uh, I was hoping you just highlight to the listeners uh, growing up, I know you used to go to Purdue, uh, university, um, and they had some special like science days where you got to learn about chemistry when you were young and your dad, you know, took you out there. Uh, yeah. Highlight kind of how your journey started, uh, to, to where you are now. Yeah. So like you said, my dad was an engineer when I was a kid and he really wanted us to be in science or math or something related. Um, and I think part of it was he's always been kind of the guy who's on the bleeding edge of technology of where like he likes to think about what's possible in that way. And I think he just knew that some of the jobs that he was preparing us for may not exist and to the computers were gonna be some important part of that. Um, and so we got a computer pretty early. Um, and I remember the internet back in the days when you had the dial tone and all of that. And so we were definitely very fortunate that that was something that my family focused on. Um, at times as a child, I didn't like it because I didn't get to go to play with my friends sometimes, but um, I grew to like it and I really ended up enjoying it. And it, it definitely changed my trajectory of where I was going in life. Um, Purdue University has a program. They still have it. I actually just talked at Purdue um, a few weeks ago and they were telling me they still do it. It's called Super Saturday and kids from anywhere I think can come, but mostly they were around the state of Indiana and it was every Saturday in the winter for like eight weeks. Mm. So we hopped in the car with our bologna sandwiches and some sodas and a cooler. And we would go up every Saturday in the winter and do these. And I was one of the youngest ones in the class. And I remember one of the days where I used science in a way that made me feel really good about myself was the egg drop. 
So we did the egg drop, which I think everybody's done it in their schooling at some point, but I hadn't yet because I was so young. Um, and we were able to drop it from the top of a, the tallest parking garage on the campus. And my dad had helped me, obviously, because he's an engineer and you just can't not help with something like that. Um, and it was just really cool because I'm here I am, I think I was seven and I'm like the seven year old who won the egg drop challenge on a college campus. Like there's just something really fun about that. Um, but yeah, so after that, there were other universities that did the same and I found this summer camp it was up at Michigan Tech University in the Northern Peninsula of Michigan. And I asked my parents if I could go. And it was really my first time ever leaving home um, for an extended period of time. And they were like, if you can raise the funds, you can do it and we'll help a little, but you, you need to really drive this. So um, I contacted all my local companies and told them about this learning opportunity I wanted to do. There was a class, I think it was genetic engineering, where you would learn about genetics and all the tools. And you actually get to use some equipment up there and stuff like that. And I was able to get it fully funded and I went and it was really cool. It was, um, it, it showed me that I could go to college outside of my hometown um, because I could leave um, because a lot of people in my town don't leave and they stay in that same vicinity. But I've always felt like I didn't belong, like I needed a bigger city. And this just helped. This showed me that, OK, I could go to college wherever I'd like. And I actually could work in a lab like I understand this. This is fun. Um, and so I did that for two summers and ended up going to college knowing something science for sure there's hands down science was involved um yeah that, that brought me to saint mary's college <laughs> yeah, no, it's saint, where is saint mary's i should have looked that up because there's one close to us uh in moraga and i know that's not it i know you're out in the midwest and yeah it was saint mary's college in notre dame indiana it is an all women's catholic institution um and it was the perfect small setting for me to get what I needed in college. So uh, like I said, I was a TA for my federal work study program. And because it was such a small place, the professor, she pulled me aside and she said, I see a sparkle in your eye. And she was like, have you ever thought about doing this? You need to take a step back like do you really want to be a doctor like what do you want to do with your life and we were able to sit down with my advisor her and the head of the education department and even though i was a junior we got me a minor in um teaching wow. uh, i did so many hours of student teaching just to get all of those observation hours in and i did all of that um but then I still wasn't sure because I did the summer REU programs there at universities and you get to conduct research as an undergrad and they look amazing on applications. Like it's just something that you're, if you're in science, you're very much encouraged to do one of those over the summer. And I was like, oh man, I like this. I like doing research. What am I going to do now? I have too many likes. What do I do? Um, and so I decided to go get my master's degree um in chicago and i i would say i lucked out but that's diminishing my my own role in what happened um i was fortunate to receive a fellowship that put me in classrooms in chicago with teachers and students and the goal of the project was to make sure that we were able to communicate with the public and that is something i had never considered before it's it's a field now um science communication, but it wasn't back then. And it was something that people really struggled with. Um, when you're an academic, you talk to other academics. You don't usually talk to children. Um, and talking to children is about the same level you would write when you write an article. And so it was this way to help train us to be better professionals. But all it did for me was tell me I was in the wrong, wrong train and I needed to get over into the education side of things. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's crazy how uh your life has has worked out and the influences that you've had and the mentorship uh, that you've created you know what luck it was you seeking out these opportunities uh and because you had like we were talking about earlier uh the influence of your dad 
exposing you at an early age to get some confidence and belief in yourself. And then for you take an action to get to that summer camp and raise all your money. I love how your parents say, Hey, great, go for it. But you need to, to flip the bill. Uh, and then you went out and got after it. Uh, and just, just awesome story to hear how you've transformed from such a young girl to who you are now and the influence that you're having again uh, with all young people trying to inspire how you've been inspired to to pay that forward and again it's just that's where i get i get crazy with the thought of the day i'm going to read that again because it, it just summarizes what we just talked about the meaning of life is to find your gift which you did uh and, and the purpose is, is to give it away which you do uh and, and that's just crazy i've been a, a high school school college uh, basketball coach for 21 years and I start every practice I start every class that I taught with the thought of the day and it's always been something that I've loved and it's always holds true to at some point during the practice or the class this thought of the day is going to come to life and really uh, get deeply rooted into the conversation and what we're doing to make sense. Um, and then for people to take that and, and kind of own it throughout uh, the rest of the lecture or day or whatever. So, so cool. Um, yeah, I, I have a feeling we're gonna have a little difference of uh, opinion on this, but I want to, to bring it up to you because you use, and I'm, I'm definitely not against technology, obviously. I mean, look at this. You're in Carmel, Indiana. I don't know you at all. Went on pod match and said, hey, uh, I would love to have you on the show. Love what you're doing. And a couple of weeks later, here we are. So obviously I'm, I'm not naive that way, but I do think uh, uh, it technology can slow things down with relationships and even just learning and, and we know our attention span is, is kind of weaning. Uh, I think it's, you know, less than seven seconds, uh, now, uh, having a hard time focusing. Um, and, and I, I guess nursing is a, is a profession where unfortunately, this is why I probably shouldn't say this, but I would go crazy, uh, of, when I was teaching my students and we were at clinical and clinical is when you're in the hospital, um, getting the hands on and nurses would be on their phone, you know, uh, while they're trying to take care of patients. And, uh, I just never agreed with that. Um, because I know that it takes time to get your thoughts back, uh, onto what you were doing. Um, and I guess is, uh, let me ask you a question cause I'm just going to keep talking, but what advice, if any, you know, do you have to parents, since you are the master educator uh, of your subject matter um, and you're using technology to do that, which is great. Again, I love what you're doing, but what advice would you have for parents to just on managing technology with, with kids? And, and I don't know, I, I know this isn't your expertise, but you know, screen time and just the influence that it's having on our brain. And I'll be quiet. <laughs> yeah, um, I know that for my son in the beginning, we didn't let him do any screen time. Um, and the pandemic kind of changed that. It got to be where it was an essential piece of the day to like let me get a minute to myself. Um, and so I had to kind of forge a new relationship with technology because before I was, I felt like it was too young. He was too young to do that. Um, but what I do with screen time, most of the time, I would say most of the time, because I'm not perfect. <laughs> no one is. Um, but we try to tie it back to life, like whatever he's doing. So like, we'll watch a Pixar movie about emotions. And then we'll talk about like, well, how did our emotions feel today? You know, like, what's the name of that one? Inside Out. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually used water beads that day to like pull out what emotions we had today and show like the color pattern and like, was this a good day or a bad day? How did you feel? Did you feel more than one emotion? They don't last forever. And like really talking about that through. So yeah, he watched a movie that day, but he also we talked about it and he got something from it. Um, and like the cartoons and things that we do let him watch all have some educational content to them. Um, but we don't do it all the time. Um, it's just, it's different for each family too. So like my son would be 
I think if we let him play with an iPad, he would never get off of it. Like it's the, he would be addicted to it. So it's something that we, we have fun games like Osmo um, and Shifu. They're um, these great games that teach science through a game. And the kid doesn't know they're learning, but they are learning about reflection, rarefaction, like all these things. And it's like, hmm, that's pretty cool. And that's a different way than I learned it. And it's actually better because he now knows that you can reflect light where I just learned it in a book. Like he did it to find an object that it was hiding. Um, and just, just like that. So it's a tricky one. And being a parent during a pandemic, I mean, there were a lot of things that were difficult, but screen time was one I heard from a lot of parents was that, how do I do this? And I just, like you had mentioned with the technology, how we're able to have this conversation right now because of it, I'm able to do live events in multiple countries trees at the same time where we are all standing in our kitchen doing the same thing because of technology and so there is there's there are places for it um and there are just definitely times when you need it um yeah for sure no i'm 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 all for it but i just think uh yeah if we're not careful and uh i'm not saying that every parent wants what's best for their kid for sure but i just had another guest that I just recorded, um, Dr. Roseanne uh, Capella Hodge uh, out of Connecticut. And she's a, a psychologist and just talking about the, the increase from the pandemic. It's been going on forever, but the pandemic uh, made it worse as well of anxiety and depression uh, and addiction to devices. Uh, the latest research from her was 7.22 hours a day, you know, outside of classroom. Uh, that, that people are spinning when you start to do the math on that. Okay. Let's just say you're in class six, seven hours. You're sleeping for a kid, you know, hopefully 10 hours. Um, all right. Then you're on the device the whole rest of the time. That's just, it's just too much time. And yeah, I think the things that we put on parents during the pandemic though was uh, they're working from home your kids home all day and you're still working and so some parents that was all they could do was like okay you're here because you can't let your kid wander outside anymore it's not like they could go outside and play with the neighbor kids everyone had to stay right where they were um and that was tricky and i actually at the beginning of the pandemic i felt like such a bad mom if I had a movie morning because I needed to get work done and I could not deal with the questions and do the work at the same time. Cause it's some, some work you can do segmented and some work needs like the full hour of concentration to like get it on paper. And I would use a Pixar movie for that. And I was like, okay, I've got to stop giving myself a hard time for this because there's literally nothing else I can do about it. You know? Um, so it's definitely the eight hours is concerning, but I, I wonder when we're out of this, what happens? I, I don't think it's a fair metric in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and again, I, I agree and support and understand, even though my kids are older, but you know, raised two, two girls and could definitely, uh, see the challenges during this time of, wow, how the heck would you work and do everything? And now all of a sudden they're the gym coach, the, the science teacher, the principal, the psychologist, uh, mom, uh, and, and every other thing. Yeah. And all while making them feel safe and not fear for their life while you yourself are fearing for your life and your parents' lives. Like, so there's like a a lot there to unpack <laughs> yeah no and that's where i'm hoping i'm really hoping this pandemic we can realize it hey that was where we were and that's where our survival instincts had to be uh during that time uh hopefully we can get through this and the virus doesn't continue to mutate and have a shut down uh, again um but uh i'm hoping and i am an optimist that that this time we'll realize, all right, well, that that's what we had to do, but that's not what, what we want to do and mm -hmm. get back and let's look at, all right, well, what is healthy uh, for myself and for my child and how can we use time now that we have it and now that our cortisol level is down and I'm not doing 50 million things uh, of jobs that were 
no really part of me, but by this pandemic, I had to take on, um, yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. And I'm just, I'm hopeful, uh, and a believer that, that we will be stronger from this thing, uh, at the, at the end of it, whenever, uh, it does end. But I just, I guess I'm just playing a little bit of devil's advocate is I just want people to be aware, uh, that, yeah, 7.22 hours is a long time. And you start looking at the addiction and, and things and, um, you know, just to check in how much time is my kid, you know, spending on it. And I love how, you know, Charlie, whenever he's doing something, um, that there's an application, uh, to what he's doing, um, and, and finding that balance, but I, I'll move on. Cause this is, uh, I know a lot of people are like, Jeff, you're smoking some serious stuff. You don't know what the heck you're talking about. And I don't have any choice in the matter, uh, of this thing. And, um, so yeah, I hope, uh, people aren't taking offense. Uh, I just, I want what's best for, for everybody. Um, but let's get into you making the best for everybody. Let's, let's allow you to talk about your business, uh, and congrats on doing that. But, uh, real quick, Ryan Education Consulting delivers research-based educational products for both the classroom and corporate settings. Uh, Ryan Education Consulting utilizes learning theory and content expertise to develop content that will stick with people, students, or employees, and to truly assess what they understand. I love that again, and truly assess what they understand. Let's start there, and what what does that mean? Um, so I'm a big proponent of formative assessment. So seeing what a kid knows and what they don't know based on what they really don't know. Um, so that means you need to ask them, ask them how they're explaining through something, not did you get 12? What did you do? And how did you get to that? Because there might have been 30 different ways that a kid gets to this that you hadn't thought of. Um, and so what I like to do is go through all of the misconceptions that kids can have about different content areas and things like that. And I make sure that if a kid picks that, you know that was the way they thought about it. Um, and so that it's not just a, a gotcha test, like they're actually useful tools in letting a teacher know that, hey, they missed four, eight, and 10. Those all were the same misconception. Here's how I might be able to help that. Here's a piece of contrasting information I could give that student to help them rebuild that model. But we can't do that if we don't know their model. So we need to ask them, like, draw what you're thinking, step me through it, talk it through. Um, and so that's what I mean by that, of truly assessing what they know, because I could pick A and not know what it was. Um, I could have guessed it and got it. Um, where if you're asking them open-ended questions or asking questions in a way that they um, that each option really gets at these different ways someone might have thought about it. It really helps narrow down how to move forward. I, I love that. Not to bring up the last guest that uh, I just interviewed too, but she does similar things with what's going on in our brain with neurofeedback and biofeedback. And I just look at not that you're necessarily getting what well, you are getting the feedback because you're asking these open ended questions and then you have the expertise to know, okay, well, okay, now I see what they're thinking. Let me fill that gap with this knowledge and then direct them into uh, seeing it from this perspective and then helping them make that connection. And boom, now they understand uh, the concept and they won't miss whatever four eight and 12 uh next time that's powerful yeah i think that one of the things that we do as a field um in in any science discipline they all have their own education field so there's mathematics education there's chemistry education physics education we all have our own silos where we've done this research but we never apply it to another silo and say like, does this work there? Or are kids getting problems that are proportional correct in physics, but not in chemistry? What are we doing? What's different here? And so what I really like to do is have some sort of connecting task between the two that highlights that, hey, this is concentration in this context, in this context, here's something that shows the midpoint and here are different ways we could talk about it. Mm. Um, so that's just, um, I also am always really big on making sure or that the materials are pretty accessible. Um, so like if I help, I help on a college lab manual and uh, one of 
of the things we did was we simplified some of the ingredients so that two-year institutions that didn't have full-blown chemistry departments could have the materials they need to do what they're doing. Um, and I just, I think that's so important and the pandemic really drove that home too, that a lot of concepts that we teach don't need fancy chemicals um, or labs to teach it. You could do it with baking soda and vinegar. And no, we don't want our professional chemists to only know baking soda and vinegar, but if you're teaching to the masses that aren't the chemistry majors and you're just trying to get concepts across, like matter cannot be created, it is conserved, things like that you can do with simpler chemicals. Um, and I think that that's a cool takeaway. And I am, a I hate saying that they're good things that come out of this, but that is a good, good thing that came out of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and there's going to be a lot of great things that, that come out of this pandemic for sure. And I, again, I'm a believer uh, on that, but I just hear in, in what you're sharing, it just sounds like that's your book. Let's give you a quick second to, to talk about, let's learn about chemistry. Uh, so the, the listeners can get out there and buy that and, and share that. Uh, with their family and maybe their classroom. Hopefully there's some teachers uh, listening in. If you are a teacher listening in, uh, I got a lot of love for you, uh, especially after what we were just talking about uh, and the challenges of you having to still continue to teach uh, through this pandemic while probably educating your children and, and everything else. Uh, so yeah, uh, highlight your book uh, a little bit about uh, even the process of how'd you come up with that? Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, give people a little bit uh, of information about it. Yeah. Um, so I was working, doing my day job and I was also watching my son and he was playing and he started sorting his toys by color. His favorite color is orange, always has been orange, still is. And he had a pile of all the orange toys. And I thought something clicked in my head. I was like, a lot of chemistry content is actually classifying things. That's the first thing we do is, is it two atoms of the same thing or something different? So is it a compound or an element? Is it a mixture or a pure substance? And things like that. And I started to think like, huh, I know that I'm a nerd and all of my nerd friends got me nerd books to give my baby but why isn't this for everybody? Um, it shouldn't just be like this nerd market. It should be for everybody. Um, and so I sat down and I pulled out all the chemistry content I could think of, more than ended up in the book, um, that could be classified like that. And I thought about the game, which of these is not like the other, because my small son could do that. You could say, would point to the one that's different, and then he would, but he wouldn't be able to tell me why. But older kids can, and sometimes their why is not what you thought. Mm -hmm. And that brings in that, like, let's see what their models are. Um, and so I uh, published the book through Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I did a Kickstarter. It was successful. Um, it actually ended up raising a little more money than was the goal. So I ended up donating a copy of the book to every Head Start program in the state of Indiana to kind of use that funds um, in, a, in a more helpful and better way. Um, and so I, the book, it's it started out very nerdy, it did. And my husband read it and was like, okay, so I'm not a chemist and I actually don't know the answers to some of these like off the top of my head without thinking. And I know that people who are not good at science are not going to like this. And I was like, oh, well that can't, that's totally the opposite of what I mean for it. And so I worked with a developmental editor who helped me break it into more parent friendly language. And so I've got the answers okay. underneath. So if you wanted to go by that, so like this would be the uh, baseball solid, a doll is solid, blocks are solid, and a carton of milk has liquid inside it. But the kids can't read, so they don't know that. But what will happen is you'll, you'll ask the question, which one of these is different and what's your evidence for why? Sometimes I get, I can throw a baseball, but I get in trouble if I throw these other things. Or I can drink milk, but I can't drink the rest. And it's like, that's not wrong. I love that that's your answer. And then I encourage the parents to just skip the whole next page. Do not even give them the science explanation. They're not ready for it yet. Just keep working on this together of asking questions. And the book is illustrated to be my son and his three best friends at the time. 
And it's their actual favorite toys. So some of the pages have like soccer balls because my son loves soccer. Um, there's one where, let's see where, there's one page that has superheroes where they're all superheroes. So the boys and the girls are superheroes. Um, and so it's getting at that so that you could do this at your house. You could sit four toys there and have them classify that. Or you could take uh, baking soda and vinegar in your kitchen and talk about chemical and physical changes um, and ask which one was this. Um, and so it's meant to really spark some conversations and it's written to make sure the parent feels super comfortable. So it even steps it out if I were to explain it to a child. So like the bathtub is filled with water, the bottle is filled with milk and the juice box is filled with apple juice. Those are all filled with liquids. Um, and so like stepping it out exactly how I would read it in a classroom, I think makes the parents feel even more comfortable because it's written in a way that they can talk to their kids and then their kid won't just like glaze over. <laughs> yeah. oh, man, that's so cool. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. And congratulations on that. And that's just something, uh, obviously it, it helped Charlie. Uh, so cool for him. Uh, to see himself in a book, uh, first of all, and, and he's still a young guy, but uh, when he gets a little bit older, he's going to even dig that even more. Uh, and then I'm I'm writing a book, but I'm not doing any Kickstarter stuff. And books are expensive. Like, they are, you, especially board books. Um, to print these, <sighs> like that is that's that's a big chunk of the cost <laughs> even the, the illustrations i'm i'm sure you know uh mine right now are yeah quite a few thousand dollars uh just to get it illustrated um but uh yeah very cool that uh, i might have to look into a, a kickstarter because i love uh, and we have head starts out here one of the jobs i had was as a school nurse uh, for a short stint uh, up in Sacramento and one of my I had four elementary schools and one head start and uh, so I believe in the head start program and everything that they're doing and I love that uh, idea that you had of donating one of your books uh, to each head start in Indiana that's awesome uh, that you did that um, and yeah so that's a great idea for me to take of hey what can I do uh, with mine and I'm going to put you on the spot since you're the the world renowned chemist <laughs> educate me make uh make me uh see pizza in the pizza making process through a chemist uh lens and i know that's <laughs> like a crazy qu a question for you but there's a lot of chemistry that's going on in in even the fermentation process uh, yep. i use a sourdough starter um uh, and then make all the my ingredients but just off the top of your head what how would i bring if i was you know bringing this to a uh, a third grade class and and i have a pizza truck that uh we go around and c4 leaders we we use pizza to just kind of help uh process life and bring people together um and build community that way but what would be the science lesson science tip that i could take and expand on uh, from your point of view definitely there are a few one i like to use pizza as an example for fractions obviously like that's one that is used a lot but that one i mean my son understands fractions pretty well at four because of looking at it in terms of food because he loves food um and so like he will be like oh there are four people so i need a quarter and it's like good that's great but he, it's always related to food <laughs> Um, you could do chemical and physical changes very easily with pizza. So chopping up a tomato and squishing it down into a sauce, if all you have done is just squished it, that is still a tomato um, and it is a physical change. But once you cook it or you add sugar, you've made a mixture. Um, I'm not sure what all your ingredients are, but what you do when you make the pizza is you form layers. So those things don't mix. And you can talk about that, that what would happen if all of the things mixed when you added them together? What, what would that pizza look like? But it'd look very different than a pizza with layers. Um, uh, the cheese browning, um, that process, the what is it, the mallard reaction? Mallard? Um, 
that talking about that of how you can never get the cheese to be white again after that like that is a chemical change and the color change is an indicator that a chemical reaction has occurred so for kids i tend to break them down into solids liquids and gases and so the fermentation process in the bread that is changing the solid and it produces a gas. So something new has been produced um, and then chemical or physical change. So I think that pizzas are a great way to do that. Yeah. I use baking a lot and s'mores a lot to teach uh, those concepts. <laughs> oh, man, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I love, uh, I love that. Yeah, and that's my goal. You know, if education opens up to take my book and take the pizza truck and get out to schools and and then read it and yeah, fractions uh, didn't even think about that one, but that's like, oh yeah, of course, uh, that's a, a great idea. So thank you for those tips. Let's change it up here, and then uh, uh, I want to be respectful of your time. This show is called Life's Essential Ingredients, and so uh, what is you know in your life? Not to get too personal, um, but uh, what are your life's essential ingredients? You know what what gets you up in the morning and uh, fired up and, and ready to go and 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 what's truly essential in your life at, at this time? Um, that's a deep question. Uh, um, we're deep. C4, yeah, C4, <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that. But normally for me and then being in my profession of, of being a nurse and, and being around death all the time, you kind of don't dance around. I mean, a lot of the conversations I have normally, I'm like, we're going heart to heart. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah. So what is, let's get a little bit deep. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, you know, what is truly essential in, in your life at this time as you're sitting there right now? I think family is definitely essential. Um, and we actually moved abroad for a while and I had a really hard time with it being so far from family. So family is hands down essential. I call my mom all the time. I'm, I'm the one who calls like, Hey, how many minutes did you put that in the oven for? <laughs> um, so definitely family. Um, I need a lot of sleep. <laughs> so sleep is definitely essential to me. Um, other than that, at the moment, I'm kind of reformatting to see like what's going on. Uh, cause I just had a whole 15 months at home with my son in a pandemic that like I became an influencer and I don't know which parts of it I plan to keep and what, what we move forward with. But I think that I definitely have to use my brain some way during the day. Um, because I, I just need to be producing something at all times. Uh, there has to be something coming out of, I need to share science in some way. <laughs> I'm such a dork. I <laughs> uh, love it. No, again, it just goes back to our, our, our quote from Pablo Picasso, you know, of sharing mm -hmm. your gift and, and, and having your purpose. And yeah, that's not a dork at all. I mean, that's, I don't want you to take this a wrong way, but I would be really, and I don't want to use the word disappointed because I don't know you, but disappointed if you didn't wake up and didn't have that passion and, and didn't have that influence and that desire to be like, Hey, I need, this is, this is why I'm here, you know, and, and it is a, a responsibility that you have, uh, to share that gift. And so, yeah, making sure that you keep surrounding yourself with family that keeps your heart full. Obviously that's huge for you. And then in order to have uh, be in that space, uh, you have to get your sleep. You know, that's another thing, uh, you know, so much research is highlighting the importance of really uh, making sure you get enough sleep uh, so we can be our best self. Uh, and in this case, learn, you know, uh, uh, if we're not sleeping and enough. enthusiasm levels. So I get that a lot of like, wow, you're just so enthusiastic about science. It's like, yeah, it's because I get my rest. Like I, I would be dragging if I didn't. Um, so what good would it be to be on podcasts and TV and things and be like, I like science. Science is fun. <laughs> so like part of being as you positive were. and optimistic, it's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, with that, I mean, those are incredible essential ingredients right there. Uh, what? Let's fast forward now because we're talking about getting deep. Um, your legacy. There's a great quote that uh, uh, from John Alston that I love. The only thing you take with you when you're gone is what you leave behind. 
what is it? Let's fast forward. I don't know how old you are, but let's go 50 years from now. Uh, and you're on your deathbed and Charlie is there. He's got his book. Uh, he's so happy. He has his family. Um, you've done an amazing job. What is it that you want to, to leave behind? What does you want people to feel uh, from their time with you? Inspired? Um, and I, I look at Charlie as the legacy. Um, so everything I'm raising him to do and be, like, I, I see that going on in him. Um, but yeah, I think I, I like to inspire people in some way. Um, and I don't ever, I didn't used to be able to pick out when I was inspiring someone, but I would have someone tell me years later, like, you know, I was having a really rough day. And that day I talked to you, you actually convinced me to stay in graduate school. And I'm like, what? I don't even remember that day, but I'm glad. <laughs> and so um, now I'm a little more cognizant of when these moments might be occurring so that I take as great of care as I should with them. <laughs> But um, definitely uh, the inspiration of others. And well, that's just a testament to to you and and how you've transformed yourself uh, of not being exactly conscious of the effect that you're having on, on other people, and then now to just have that effect because you handle your business each and every day, and it's who you are, and, and you don't even have to. I wouldn't say you don't have to work on them because you put in crazy work every day to be who you are. And I'm not going to be clear on this, but since you've done that work, it's who you are. I don't know if that makes mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, and then now, since you are that person, other people that get to rub elbows with you, get to see your beautiful smile, get to watch you on your Instagram get to get to feel that passion and that inspiration. Uh, and so I sure hope you feel incredible um, by the person uh, of who you are and who you are becoming and who you continue to grow uh, and share. Uh, and thank you so much for that. The last thing, and then we're gone. Uh, but I got to put C4, as you know, is an explosive, is powerful. And, and part of our process is I created this light to fuse, which is kind of a goal setting, but we're not going to get into that. It's really about taking action. What is one action um, that... Uh, Let's just say a, a parent, because I don't think I have any young, young listeners um, uh, tuning into this, but what's one action that a parent could take uh, when they're listening to this of like, God, just go do this one thing uh, to help uh, 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 educate yourself or your your child or anything. I would, I'll broaden it out for you. Any, I would any, say I have two. Okay. Um, one would be to get out some baking soda and vinegar and a bowl and see how your kid reacts to it. Just observe, ask the questions, what's happening? How do you know that? What do you think's inside those bubbles? And just getting that conversation going and see how easier, how much easier it is than you thought it was going to be. Like that fear, like kind of work past that fear a little bit. Um, and the other thing is at your next baby shower or birthday gift or Christmas gift, give a science book, give a science toy. Um, one of my son's favorite toys that I got him when he was little was a pair of binoculars. Um, and it came with a toy microscope. They came together and he likes to pick up leaves and bugs out of the yard and look at them. And that is, I don't have to do anything. He just goes and grabs stuff and does it. And it's like, I didn't even have to cultivate that. It was just there. Um, all you have to do is show them how to use it. And that's got instructions in the box. So I think that your kids all have an interest in something, um, bugs, dinosaurs, something. So there is the science book out there that is for you. It is for your family. It is not just for scientists who have kids, their families, it's for everybody. Um, and your kid will be so much better off having had these experiences and these tools as a little, little one, um, for sure. I love it. Those are two incredible tips 
Uh, and again, if you want to find and learn more about the amazing Dr. Stephanie Ryan, she has her own company that she started, RyanEducationConsulting.com. You can get on there, contact her. I uh, would highly suggest you get on her Instagram. Uh, let's learn about science. Again, let's learn about science. Dr. Stephanie Ryan, uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, really appreciate you giving me some tips for my pizza uh, and, and making that uh, more relatable to students when we get out to schools and things. Listeners, we thank you for tuning in to another episode of Life's Essential Ingredients, uh, and we will see you next week. Thank you.